All right, hey y'all, how's it going? Um, a little update on where we are kind of with the end of this school year and everything that's uh, going on, kind of closing things up. So uh, today and tomorrow, uh, what you guys have going on is that I'm going to be doing this little lesson on sound, right? Kind of, uh, I've got these special topics with these kind of last few days. Uh, since we've covered just about everything that we need to know, and this is more just stuff that I think is, is fun to know or useful or kind of cool or interesting uh, physics applications, uh, that I'd like you guys to just kind of be aware of and, and be able to talk about and know more about in, in an interesting way. So that's what's going to be going on. Um, so that's uh, this these couple days. Uh, Friday's going to be actually a day off, so you guys can take that time to catch up on any work that you're missing. Um, and uh, then on Monday and Wednesday, we're also just going to have some special topics on kind of cosmology, astronomy, and the uh, formation of the elements, as well as kind of wrapping up just kind of the last last few days. So these aren't going to be days with um, a lot of work. I know that some of you guys may have AP exams coming up on those days. Um, so no uh, no real kind of pressure uh, with these, but I, it's just stuff that I think would be good for you guys to know, especially uh, with this formation of the elements um, as it relates to chemistry and what you guys are going to be taking next year. Uh, there'll be some good stuff to know there. Uh, but today, my goal is uh, to get you guys uh, as much information as you can get about sound in about a half hour is, is going to be the timeline I'm going to try and do that in. Everything that you could possibly know about sound um, <laughs> or need to know about sound in that short amount of time. Now, I should say sound is one of my favorite topics uh, within physics. It's, uh, it's just a really cool phenomenon. Um, I think it has some great applications in, in the world around us. Uh, all of us like to listen to music. We all hear things. It's one of an, one of our sensory things. Um, and I'm really passionate about kind of the interface and the physics of kind of our biology and our senses and how that actually works. So similar like with vision and color, that's something I think is really fascinating. Sound is also uh, kind of equally cool. So here's what we got going on. Uh, so what exactly is sound, right? So this is the topic. These are the questions that we're going to try and answer today. And we'll start with this one. What exactly is sound? And sound is just a pressure wave is, is really how we could describe it. So we could actually even say here, just draw a little arrow and we could say sound is a pressure wave, right? Uh, now, what does that mean? Kind of, it's, it's a little bit of a vague uh, definition, but essentially if you have some kind of a medium, some kind of a material that that, that sound wave travels through, uh, a lot of times we'll talk about it as being air, uh, but it's not necessarily air, it could be uh, water. You can actually hear sounds uh, underwater. Uh, it could be through a solid. Uh, for example, one thing that I'd like you guys to kind of build today, and, and if you haven't already uh, done it or never done it, it's just a cool thing to do, uh, is to make a string telephone uh, using like cans or cups and string. It's amazing how well you can transmit sound using that through a solid. Um, but that's 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 what a sound is, it's this pressure wave. So we have uh, these molecules, right, that make things up. You may have heard that uh, sound can't travel through a vacuum. That's because there's no matter uh, for that pressure wave to be transmitted through. So like air molecules right around us. Um, if I do like a clap, for example, uh, what I'm doing is I am kind of squeezing those air molecules and pushing them out. And as they kind of go and they accelerate, they run into each other, right? They run into and, and they push into each other and collide and, and they, they kind of transfer uh, their motion or their momentum and that's how that pressure wave kind of travels uh, through and so that's what it is so how do we create these sound waves how do we create these pressure waves through different materials uh, we just need to have some kind of a way to to kind of push that material uh, to send like a pressure or shock wave through it um, so like uh, with the air like my vocal cords uh, my larynx they actually it vibrates and that pushes on the air um, with a clap we can push the air that away um, with, in the case of like a, a drum or something, you have like a membrane, right, uh, that can kind of push on the air. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways to do it, right? I've, I'll kind of reference these later, but there's, there's a tuning fork. These have these little metal tines that actually uh, kind of push on the air molecules, right? Um, and so that's how we actually kind of create these sound waves, is we just need any kind of way to, to kind of push on those materials. Um, one thing to note uh, is just with the speed of sound, uh, it does vary through different mediums, the, the rate at which that wave travels. Um, so in like rubber, for example, rubber is a good insulator. Typically the more solid and the more dense something is, the better transmits sound. Uh, but other things like rubber, they don't actually transmit it very well because of their uh, molecular composition. But like in air at, at different temperatures, it changes at different densities. So at different altitudes, the speed of sound changes. But it's around 340 to 350 meters per second. Um, is how is how fast uh, sound travels in air, right? So if you're traveling, you know, th if you were standing 340 meters away from someone and they said something, uh, it would take one second for that sound to reach you. 
Now, cool application of this, you guys may have heard like with, uh, you know, thunderstorms, when you see lightning, right? That creates a sound wave, which we call thunder. And that wave uh, travels at, a, at the speed of sound in that atmosphere. And so it, it takes a certain amount of time to get to you. So you guys may have heard like you can count the number of seconds that it takes to get to you to figure out how far away it is, right? Well, if it's, you know, 350 meters per second um, and a mile is about 1600 meters, you can imagine if it takes, let's do some quick math, about four and a half, five seconds, right? Then it's a mile away. Right, so that's how you can actually use the speed of sound uh, to kind of calculate distances, which is pretty cool. Now, like I mentioned, through solids and more dense materials, uh, even like water, uh, it travels a little bit faster and then like other solids like this. Um, so a water, I, I just realized it doesn't actually have this on this one, but the speed of sound in water is about, I think it's, let's see, if we look this up, speed of sound through water ends up being Let's see right there. So in water, it's about 1,500 uh, meters per second. So it travels significantly faster in water and then even faster through solids like glass and steel it can actually travel quite fast. Um, so that's the, that's the speed of sound. So that's an, a nifty little thing. Uh, and this is a good way to kind of mess around that. You'd be surprised how quickly that sound can travel uh, through that string uh, versus just like in air. If you can get really long like the string, like the length of a football field uh, and get real taut and use this system, uh, you would be able to hear the sound uh, through this through the string telephone before you could hear it in the air, which is really cool. Um, so let's see. So that's how we create sound waves. Oh, another way uh, is with like a speaker. I've included a great video here about how a speaker works um, that you that you guys can check out. You can also actually build your own speaker. I've included a link for that as well. It's really not that complicated. In fact, we almost basically did it already. If you guys remember when we worked with uh, electricity and magnetism? If you take a copper wire and you kind of coil it around and then you hook it up to a battery and you place a magnet underneath it, then that'll cause that wire to jump up and down. And you guys may remember that we could get the, the coil of wire to go up and down and up and down if we turn the circuit on, off, on, off, on, off. It'll jump up and down and it'll vibrate back and forth. And if we have something that's vibrating back and forth, it can push on something like air. And that's how a speaker works, right? It's just this vibrating membrane that is pushing on air and it's controlled by turning the circuit on and off. So this is a cool video. I recommend checking that out for sure. Um, so that's how we create sound waves. We just need some way to kind of push on and create this pressure wave that can travel through this medium. So if we have anything that can push on air, right, we can create a sound wave in that air. That's all it takes, right? Um, it's kind of cool. So that's how we create them. How can we visualize them? All right, right, right. What does that actually look like? Well, I've included a link to this uh, cool simulation from the physics classroom. Um, and this kind of shows like air. And if I kind of show it playing, and let's go ahead and turn down the frequency a little bit. There we go. So that's a, that's a less frequency. So uh, similar to like light waves, uh, we can talk about uh, sound waves in a similar fashion, right? They have a certain frequency. They have a certain wavelength. Uh, they have a certain speed. Um, the main thing that we're going to be concerned with with sound here is is the frequency as well as the amplitude. Uh, that's going to be another thing. The speed depends on the medium, right? If we have a uh, faster medium uh, like like a string or like a solid or like water, right? Then that wave will travel faster. If we have a slower medium like air, it'll travel more slowly. Um, and the frequency is how 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 frequently that pressure wave is coming, right? So if I just have a one time clap, right? Then that's one one clap per second. Right. If I do one clap per second, then that's the frequency of those sound waves. Uh, if I do 20 claps per second, then that's a totally different sound. Right. So we uh, the the frequency of the sound kind of controls something that's called pitch, which is essentially the, uh, how kind of high pitch something is. Uh, so for example, if if we look at like a guitar, for example, or, or a sound making instrument, if I have a if I create if I go from a low pitch to a higher pitch. Right, you can you can tell pitch is kind of like how how high or how low that's how we perceive that sound to be. So that's pitch, right? And that is controlled by the frequency. It's so the number of waves that are being generated per second. And so what this looks like is if we increase the frequency, you can see here we have air, right? And and there's a pressure wave being sent through that air. And so that air is being compressed, and and then that compression is being passed along. So if I turn up this frequency, you can see it a little bit better. So we have a, a kind of pressure wave on this side, and then that pressure wave travels through the medium as these air molecules run into each other. Now here we have a recurring wave, right? So it's being continuously produced, right? So we get a, a kind of a regular kind of wave motion here. And as we increase the frequency even more, you can see that there's more of those waves going by 
per second. Now, uh, and you can see it's just it's being transferred through this medium. Now we can also visualize this as as like a as as a non-pressure wave, as a longitudinal wave, like we've seen with light waves before, uh, where these peaks kind of represent high pressure, and then these troughs represent low pressure, right? So the peaks represent high pressure, right? Areas where there's high there's that high pressure that that's actually traveling through, and then the troughs represent low pressure, right? And both of these can actually be perceived uh, by us as as kind of like these sounds, but that's that's what sound is. It's this pressure wave. Um, and the amplitude uh, relates to the loudness, right? So uh, essentially it's the strength of that pressure. So if you have a really kind of loud like clap, right? And that created a really strong kind of pressure wave. There's a great pressure density, right? In that wave where they're really compressed together and they're really spread out. As a soft clap, right, is, is, is a lower amplitude, right? That pressure wave is not as strong. There's not as big of a differentiation between high pressure and low pressure. Right, uh, so that's what they actually look like. Now, another way that we can kind of visualize this um, is, uh, you know, here we have if we've got a speaker, for example. Um, and if I play this, we can actually see that there are kind of these pressure waves. The white represents kind of high pressure. The dark represents low pressure. So we can represent them in that way. And the greater the amplitude, right, the more the speaker is kind of pushing, right, and the greater that difference in pressure actually is. Whereas the lower the amplitude, the less. And we can change the uh, frequency. And as we change the number of waves that are going by per second, right, it changes the actual pitch that we hear going from really low pitches, right, to really high pitches. So it's kind of cool. Um, so that's how we can actually visualize these sound waves. It's just kind of like regular waves. We can use that longitudinal waveform where the peaks represent high pressure, the troughs represent low pressure, or we could talk about it as that actual kind of pressure wave itself. Now, what do we actually do with that pressure wave? What does that really mean? How do we perceive that? It is a physical phenomena, right? It's something that actually happens. Sound is all around us. There's always these kind of within air, within any medium, there's these vibrations, these, there's these pressures, pressure uh, waves that are transmitted through them, right? But how do we actually perceive them? How do we sense them, right? This is, this is where it gets kind of cool. So human hearing, we can actually hear a range from 20 hertz, so 20 pressure waves per second, to 20,000 hertz. 20,000 pressure waves per second. So it's a huge range of variation. Uh, and within that, we perceive them differently. So on these very, very low notes, right, it's like these what we call really low, deep bass notes, right, that we can almost more feel with our bodies than we can actually hear, right? Compare that to the very high end of human hearing, right, where it's it almost blends into this like hiss, this like drone, it's like, it's like, you know, it's kind of almost like uncomfortable. It, it doesn't really register as any like kind of note. Um, and then we get down here into more of these other kind of ranges, uh, mid-range kind of notes, uh, frequencies about around a thousand uh, pressure waves per second, right? That's kind of, we hear a lot of instruments there uh, as, as well as in this lower range um, down to like 200 uh, or so uh, f uh, pressure waves per second. And so, based on those different frequencies, right, we can generate those with like a speaker or something. And it's actually cool. I wish we were in the classroom because we have these sound drivers and we can go through this whole range and you guys can actually hear uh, what they sound like. And it's really cool to go through all of that. Um, one thing that is also uh, kind of cool to know is that human hearing, we go from uh, 20 hertz to uh, 20,000 hertz. Uh, different animals uh, can perceive different ranges as well. So you guys may have heard like a dog whistle, for example. Uh, we can't hear them. Uh, but dogs can, so and that's because dogs' uh, hearing range goes a little bit above 20,000 hertz, right? So if we create a, a sound wave that is, you know, more than 20,000 uh, pressure waves per second, we can't hear, but the dog can, right? Uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, elephants uh, similarly create a very can create very low range, below 20 hertz, that we actually can't hear, but they can use to communicate. Uh, the same is true with whales. Now whales, it's extra interesting. They can produce these real low tones that we can't hear. And they also produce those sounds in water. So their sounds travel faster, they travel farther uh, than they do in air. So whales can actually communicate using these very low, low frequency, right? So very low number of pressure waves per second, but traveling a great distance over water. Uh, similarly, bats, uh, very cool. Using echolocation, uh, a lot of the sounds that they actually produce uh, using that echolocation, uh, we actually can't even hear. So if you guys have ever been lucky enough to, to see bats flying, and you can hear some of the notes that they make, but also uh, some of them you can't, they're in a higher range. Um, same with some insects. It's really cool. Uh, sounds that are greater than that 20,000 hertz, we call those ultrasound. Uh, you guys may have heard of like ultrasonic uh, 
uh, sensors um, or ultrasound, right, uh, for like pregnancy, so you can see where the baby is. Uh, that, that uses wavelengths that are higher than we can actually hear, uh, but they can still be perceived. They're very real, like pressure waves still. And then we've got infrasound, which is lower, and so there's some cool things um, like earthquakes create pressure waves moving through the ground and, and then through the air, but they're at a frequency that's too low, so we can't actually hear them. Uh, same with like volcanic eruptions. Um, when volcanoes are kind of grumbling, we can actually hear a volcanic eruption. Uh, but And then also um, ocean waves. Kind of cool things, right? Things that create, there's all sorts of these things in nature that create these sounds, these pressure waves that are frequencies that we can't hear, right, uh, with our ears. So that's kind of cool. Um, so how do our ears actually work to hear this? Well, here we've got like a little diagram of an ear. Uh, and this is, <laughs> this is so cool. Um, so sound waves travel uh, down your ear canal. So there's, there's this pressure wave, these pressure waves of air, they travel down your ear canal and they come to this thing called the tympanic membrane. And this is just kind of a flexible, you may also know it as your eardrum, right? It's this flexible membrane that can move back and forth. And so as those pressure waves hit it, they push on this membrane, right? As we have an area of high pressure, it pushes on that membrane. Right? And then low pressure, it kind of moves back into place. And then high pressure, it pushes on it. And then low pressure moves back into place. So this membrane vibrates back and forth at the same frequency that those pressure waves are coming in at. Right? And then this, uh, this eardrum, your tympanic membrane, is hooked up to these three bones. It's attached to these three bones, uh, the hammer, uh, the anvil, and the stapes. Three little bones. And these actually work to kind of amplify or transfer uh, that sound to this thing called the your inner ear is the name for the whole thing. Uh, and it has some cool stuff that has to do with uh, balance, right? These kind of loops up here are used for your balance and sensing like, you know, where your where your position is. Um, but then this cochlea is actually used for hearing. That's the part that's actually used to perceive those sound waves, right? To actually transfer those physical sound waves, some of which we can actually feel, but to transfer them into a sound signal that our brains can perceive and hear and make sense of and, and do something with. Um, and it's really fascinating how that happens. There's also one other thing in here is, is this eustachian uh, tube. You guys may heard of this. This is a little uh, kind of open space inside your brain. And uh, like when you go up in altitude, um, right, the pressure in your, the pressure, the air pressure around you decreases, it drops, right? Uh, so that means, but the uh, pressure inside of your head, your internal head pressure within this air cavity in the eustachian tube is higher than, than the air pressure outside. So it's pushing on your tympanic membrane and that hurts and your ears kind of hurt. And what you need to do is you can kind of yawn or chew something and that creates uh, just little gaps where air can kind of get through uh, to equalize the pressure. And that's when your ears pop, right? Is when that is actually happening. So you'll notice that going up in planes and the same is true when you like drop down, you need, you need more air to come into your station tubes and that can really hurt. And so if you yawn, you can equalize that pressure. Um, so you'll notice that going up and uh, up and down in airplanes. I noticed that here driving over mountain passes in Colorado. It's kind of cool. So that's, anyways, the ear. So we've got this, a sound wave that's transferred, uh, you know, the membrane picks it up and vibrates back and forth. That causes these bones to vibrate back and forth, which causes the stapes to push, right, on, on this inner ear. And this inner ear is actually filled with fluid. And we can diagram it kind of like this. Let's see. Sorry, I'm going off screen. Right, so here are those three bones. And then here's the stapes and it pushes on this liquid inside of the cochlea. And the cochlea is kind of like, it's this like snail shell type thing. It spirals in and then it spirals out, right? And all along this spiral, right? And like I said, so sound waves, they can travel through air, they can travel through solids, they can travel through liquids and they travel actually faster through liquids than through air, right? So this is all filled with a liquid. It's essentially kind of like a, a salty water, right? And all along this kind of channel where those, where those pressure waves are transmitted, in the, in the cochlea, there are these little tiny hairs called cilia. And these little tiny hairs, at the base of each one of these hairs, it's connected to these nerve cells. And when those hairs move, when, when, they, when they get moved or pushed one direction, or when they move back and forth, so when a sound wave goes through here, right, it sends a pressure wave through there. So the hair, you know, when, it, when it's pushed by the pressure, it moves one way and then it moves back into place and then it moves one way and then it moves back into place. Right. And so, similar to like waves on the shore, you know, kind of moving like seaweed back and forth. That's like what's going on with these hairs. So they're vibrating back and forth. They're wiggling back and forth at the frequency that that wave is traveling through your your cochlea. Right. It's so cool. So those those hairs vibrate back and forth. And those hairs at the base of those hairs are little nerve cells. And they pick up that motion, that physical motion. And they send that as an electrical impulse through these auditory nerves to your brain. And so your brain can actually perceive that there is sound, that you're hearing something. That's how that works. And just to talk about like how important hairs are in like sensing things like this, 
Um, cause it's crazy that like the way that you can hear things is because there's little tiny hairs on the inside of your inner ear that switch back and forth, right? When they're pushed because you get this membrane that's moving at the frequency which the sound is coming in, which is pushing this stirrup at the frequency which the sound is coming in, which is creating a pressure wave in this cochlea in the water and that cochlea that's moving back and forth at that same frequency. And like your hairs are so sensitive. Uh, it's such a cool like thing. If you even notice like with hairs, if you take like hairs on your arm, like when you move those hairs, right, you can, you can feel it without even touching your skin. Just moving those hairs, it's incredibly sensitive. In fact, it's more sensitive than your skin itself. Right? There's more nerves at the bases of those hairs than there are in the rest of your skin. And so when you move those hairs, you can really feel it. It's the same in your inner ear. Right? And it sends a signal to your ear uh, based on the frequency that you can interpret in your brain as hearing sound. It's pretty amazing. It really is super cool. Um, so that's that. So uh, cool videos I want you guys to check out. One is what is this loudest sound possible or loudest possible sound. I don't know if he actually does a good job of answering that question, but he does talk a lot about like how loud of things we can hear, which we use measure using the scale called decibels. Um, so we can actually hear things that are very loud and very soft, right? We've got this huge range of, of intensities, of amplitudes, of pressure waves that we can hear, as well as the frequency that we can detect, right? We've got this huge range, and so hearing is, is a very important uh, sense. And then uh, going to this last kind of question, so that what is sound? How do we create sound waves? How do we visualize sound waves? How are we able to hear them or pick them up? And then this last one is, you know, so we've got the sound. We've got these sound waves. We can hear some of them. Um, we can, you know, detect their loudness, right? How strong those pressure waves are. But then how can we then use the sound to create music, right? Um, and that's where, that's where sound kind of becomes like this beautiful thing where it's not just like this physical phenomenon, but it's actually something that can be pleasing and can listen emotions and all sorts of things. Um, this is a link to a video by this guy, Steve Mould, who I've, I've referenced before, one of my favorite guys. Uh, he uses a thing called a uh, Rubens tube. Uh, very, very cool. You can look these up, look up Rubens tube, look up Ruben, Rubens plates. Um, it's really cool. And it talks about this idea of resonance. So this is an important thing when we start to talk about music. And I rec recommend that you guys check out that video is, um, if we have these sound waves, right? Uh, these sound waves can interact with each other in different ways. Um, so if we have like a, like a string or something that is, that is trapped in place and can kind of vibrate back and forth, um, or like a, a tine like this, like a tuning fork, uh, that is kind of set in position or like a tube. Like if you guys have ever blown in a bottle before, uh, you can kind of make a sound, right? And that's because within that confined space, you get uh, waves, the waves will interfere with each other in a particular way. Now, when waves have constructive interference, right, that's when the peaks of those sound waves line up, right? Uh, and so that happens, that creates amplification or makes it louder, right? Because the peaks, those, those two pressures combine and they create more pressure, right? And the absence of pressure combined, it creates really low pressure. Right, so that's constructive interference where waves combine to create uh, louder noises. And then we have destructive interference, uh, which is where uh, the high pressure of one comes with the low pressure of the other and they meet and they cancel each other out. Right, High pressure and low pressure means that there's no kind of difference in pressure all around. So that's interference and this can actually happen in, in more complex ways where it's not just perfect like amplification or, or uh, kind of destruction. Uh, but we have, let's say we have wave one, which is this blue one and wave two, which is this green one, right? So depending on how they line up and where, you know, there's there's low pressure and high pressure, we get a new waveform, which is this red one, which has this kind of irregular pattern to it. And so that's how we can uh, kind of combine waves to create new and, and kind of unique sounds. And anytime that we have like different frequencies that are combining, uh, we get kind of cool waveforms like this. So if you ever look at like a song or even like a more complex note from like an instrument, you'll see something like this kind of red wave where it's a little bit more complex. Um, so definitely recommend checking out that video. And so then how we actually create music is if we have something like, I'll just use this tuning fork because these are um, kind of classically used to tune. So this one, you guys can see is actually set up at a C, 256 Hertz, right? I also have one that's an E at 320 Hertz. And that's determined by, by the material. Um, it's determined by the, the length of them. You can notice one is a little bit shorter. The uh, 320 Hertz one is shorter. It's because it's shorter, it's gonna vibrate uh, back and forth. These tines are gonna vibrate back and forth at a higher frequency. So we're gonna get a higher pitch note. So this is the C. Sorry if that's too loud. And this is the E. Right? So it's a slightly higher pitch, slightly higher frequency. And if you combine them, 
right? Then we get that kind of interesting uh, interference where they they mesh with, with each other in different ways. Now, one thing uh, that he talks about in the video about resonance too is that these, uh, you know, they're vibrating back and forth at the same at that same frequency the whole time. So you get this kind of amplified sound. Now, in a tube or on a string, uh, you can really uh, notice this. Um, so, like with the guitar, for example, um, here if I play one of these strings, right? What happens is this string is vibrating back and forth, and depending on um, on essentially the number of kind of you get what are called standing waves in here. Uh, so depending on like the number of standing waves that we have in here, you'll get like a different uh, kind of pitch, higher or lower. And so you can kind of tell that with harmonics. So this is the what we call the first harmonic, right? Um, on on the E string, right? So that's the first harmonic. So it's just one big vibration. Here though, is the second harmonic. So I've created two kind of waves. So instead of, so the first harmonic is like one big wave from point to point vibrating up and down. Second harmonic, it's like I've got this point that's fixed, this point that's fixed, and this point that's fixed. And so it goes up and then down like that. And then it switches, it flip flops. And I can do the same with the third harmonic. So first, second, third. So it's kind of cool. Uh, and then you can also change the sound uh, just playing in first harmonics, which is just kind of open strings, uh, with by shortening the length of the string. So similar to by shortening the length of the tuning fork, I uh, made its pitch higher, I made it uh, vibrate more frequently, increase the frequency. I can do the same with the strings. Right, as I shorten the string by moving my hands on these frets, um, I increase the pitch and I can create a different sound. Uh, and then if you think of notes, right, if I take a bunch of these different strings, just like these tuning forks, and I combine them together, I can create a note, which is all these different strings kind of interlaid together, which our ears kind of pick up as this more complex sound. Now I still hear this, this is a G, and I still hear it as a G, uh, but it's got, um, it's a more full G than just playing, this is also a G. So that's a G. But this I also hear is a G, but I've got all those different kind of notes, so it's got a more interesting character to it, or also known as uh, kind of like the timber uh, of the instrument. It's, it's, well, actually that might not be the timber, but the, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of those different, so when we talk about those waves super superimposing, uh, overall it has the same kind of regular frequency as a G, um, but it also has some different kind of notes within it as well to add to it that make it a little bit more complex and a little bit more enriched, right? So that's how we can actually use, uh, create sound waves and use them to create music. And then we can record it, we can play it through a speaker, and that's that's all that. So uh, hopefully, uh, make sure you guys kind of check out some of those links, watch some of those other videos, uh, check it out. Um, like I said, sound is one of my favorite topics. I would love to have made speakers with you guys, play those different frequencies, it's such a cool thing. But hopefully you guys uh, learned something cool today. Um, hopefully you guys find it interesting. Hopefully you guys feel uh, empowered to kind of continue your own education and look up things about sound. And uh, that's that, yeah. So I'll leave you guys with a little uh, Weezer. Oh, that was bad. Super fun. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time. Hope life's good.